Hello everyone, welcome back to the Capablanca saga and we are back to the 1911 San Sebastian tournament where this is round 4, Capablanca has 2 wins and a draw against Frank James Marshall, uh, here he faces none other than Dr. Zygbert Tarasch. Now uh, Zygbert Tarasch was uh, one of the strongest players in the world as we already mentioned, but not only that, uh, his actual profession was, um, well he was a doctor, uh, he finished medical school and he had his own medical practice uh, where he of course practiced medicine. And uh, that that often interfered with his uh, chess life and uh, I guess it's a bit weird to say interfered uh, as okay saving lives of, is more important than playing chess but uh, well it, it often did uh, for example in 1892 he had the opportunity to face uh, Wilhelm Steinitz for the title uh, but he passed um, he, he rejected the offer as he had um, well uh, other work to do m medical wise and uh, in those days um, for example in tournaments uh, out of the four times he faced Steinitz he beat him three times uh, and uh, one time they drew so uh, the odds were definitely in his favor and later uh, he when Lasker became world champion he uh, Lasker uh, always had better results against other opponents uh, in tournaments and uh, finally when Zygbert Tarasch uh, got his oppor opportunity to face Lasker in 1908 uh, Lasker beat him uh, uh, you know, with uh, w with quite a score, I believe it was uh, eight to three uh, or something like that. But uh, uh, definitely a, a convincing result. Uh, but uh, yeah, definitely a strong player. And here he has uh, the white pieces against Jose Ruiz Capablanca, and it's uh, Capa's first time uh, facing uh, this great player. So let's see how it goes. And yes, uh, by this point, Capa does know some uh, opening theory. For those of you who are wondering. Uh, so let's check it out. Uh, we have e4 by Tarash, e5, we have knight to f3, knight to c6, and bishop to c4. And um, yeah, it's an Italian game. Uh, Tarash was uh, very much known for his uh, skills uh, in the opening and, uh, well, middle game and end game. Uh, but uh, he contributed a lot to, to theory. For example, you all know the Tarash defense to the uh, Queen's Gambit, you know, the Tarash line of the French defense. Uh, uh, a lot of interesting uh, ideas uh, bear the, the name of Tarash. Uh, so, okay, bishop to c5, and here, unfortunately, we do not have the Evans Gambit, but, okay, c3, the Joko Piano. Uh, the, uh, we have knight to f6, d4, uh, we have e captures on d4, c captures on d4, and bishop to b4 check. And here, bishop to d2 by Tarash. Uh, for those of you who are perhaps new to chess, one of the uh, more exciting uh, attacks in chess in general is the Greco attack, which uh, can happen if white goes for knight to c3. And uh, it's, uh, of course, it will not work against someone like Capablanca, but uh, against uh, weaker players, uh, you can always uh, try it. Or if you're just starting out, feel free to try the Greco attack to, uh, on your own. Uh, it's an idea. You, you block check, but you also give up the e4 pawn. And after knight captures, you can just castle. And here, while black has uh, a variety of ways to continue this game, uh, in the olden days when uh, weaker players faced masters, often the games would go like knight captures on c3, b captures, and bishop captures. Uh, here, white would go queen b3, offer the rook, and after black captured the rook, uh, white would finish the game with a very nice attack. After bishop captures on f7, king f8, bishop g8 now. Uh, forcing the knight to block the attack against the queen. The queen has nowhere to go after knight blocks. Uh, rook e1 and it's all over. There's no way to prevent the bishop captures on e7. Whatever uh, whatever you play, bishop captures, 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 and now, uh, well, pretty much anything will win for white, but um, that that is a one... one uh, way a, a Greco attack can happen. Uh, but here, bishop to d2 instead. Uh, we have bishop captures by Capablanca, knight captures, and now comes d5. d6 would be uh, a bit too slow, so Capablanca uses the, this bishop and pawn uh, to uh, bust uh, white's center and, uh, you know, speed up his development. e captures on d5, we have knight captures on d5, and now queen to b3, with a double attack against the knight on d5. Also, the knight cannot move as the pawn on f7 would fall. So we have knight c to e7, defending the knight now with the knight queen, and also c6 is coming fairly soon. Uh, we have castles by Tarash, castles by Capablanca, and now rook f to e1. Uh, developing the rook, uh, we have c6 now, uh, giving further control to the d5 square, and now a4, grabbing space on the queen side, also preventing b5. 
Uh, we have queen to b6, Capablanca offers a queen trade, and now comes queen to a3. Capablanca has to be careful now if he plays something like bishop to g4, then of course you all saw the threat after queen a3. Uh, rook captures on, a, uh, on e7, and white would happily give up the rook for, for two knights. Uh, so, of course, uh, after this queen to a3 move, Capablanca simply blocks the rook. Bishop to e6, a nice developing move. Uh, and here we have uh, a5. And as the story goes here, uh, Tarash went into a, uh, into a deep think as uh, he wasn't uh, really sure how to continue this game, even though this was uh, still considered opening theory at the time. Uh, for example, even in 1898, uh, Mikhail Chigorin played against Karl Schlechter here and knight to e4 was the move here. Uh, but that game ended in a draw. But here, after a5, we have a new game uh, between the, the two gentlemen. Uh, the queen has to go back, we have queen to c7, and now comes knight to e4. An excellent square for the knight, uh, and now rook a to d8. Uh, Capablanca introduces uh, the queenside rook into the game. Uh, knight to c5. Uh, now, uh, again, an excellent square for the knight. It's a bit, uh, not. Uh, it's not all that great to try and kick it out with b6. And the bishop on e6 is under attack. So Capablanca brings it back. We have bishop to c8. Also, the bishop is now uh, giving further control to the queen side. And now comes g3. Taking away the f4 square from Capablanca's knight. And also inviting Capablanca to maybe go bishop to h3. And while this is a possibility, white really wants to play a6 here. And uh, then either exchange everything and leave black with a weak a7 pawn, or if black decides to push the pawn, let's say b5, uh, then the after bishop moves, then the c6 pawn becomes weak. Uh, white can always play rook to c1, perhaps even double rooks on the c-file, and go after this c6 weakness of a pawn. Uh, so, after g3, we have knight to f5. Uh, we have rook a to d1, now developing the other knight, as, uh, the other rook as well, as the d4 pawn is somewhat pressured, and now knight to d6. Uh, attacking the bishop, uh, and here Capablanca, uh, Taras decides to capture on d5. Bishop captures on d5, uh, and now comes not c captures, but first knight to b5, attacking the queen and opening up uh, a discovered attack from the rook to the bishop. Uh, queen to b4 and only now rook captures uh, on d5. And now uh, uh, knight to d3. Now both of the knights are controlling the e5 square and you really want to take uh, take a hold of that square. Uh, bishop to g4, now again developing this bishop and now comes knight d to e5. Uh, an excellent square for the knight and also you're uh, defending the, uh, the knight uh, on f3. And here we have h5 uh, defending the bishop on g4. Uh, we have uh, knight captures on g4, h captures on g4, forcing this knight to move, and now comes knight to h4, and rook f to d8. So, uh, as you can see now, Capablanca forced uh, Tarash's knight to h4, and he has this excellent attack against the d4 pawn. The knight, the rook, and the other rook are all uh, attacking uh, this uh, pawn on d4. Uh, I even used a, a green square here to really point it out. Uh, and now we have rook uh, to e7. Uh, any slow move here, as there's really no good way to defend it, uh, you have to uh, you have to play actively. So rook to e7, attacking Capablanca's queen. Uh, we have queen to d6, offering a queen trade, and now queen captures on d6. Knight captures on d6, the knight from d6 also protects the b7 pawn, and now what uh, Tarash wanted to play all along, a6. He wants to create a weak a7 pawn, but also if black decides to push the pawn, then the c6 pawn becomes weak as well. Uh, Capablanca captures, we have b captures on a6, rook captures on a7, and now comes knight to b5. Attacking the rook and the d4 pawn, uh, rook captures on a6, and now knight captures on d4. Grabbing... Uh, uh, the pawn here and also keeping an eye on the c6 pawn uh, but also uh, preparing uh, a lot of uh, nasty threats here for example if this knight uh, was to be developed let's say uh, if tarash were to introduce it into the game via knight to g2 then black could immediately go knight f3 check and then black wins uh, as the rook on d1 is unguarded uh, but tarash says uh, no way jose and he goes king to f1 not allowing knight to f3 uh, to come with check uh, so g5, forcing the knight back, we have knight to g2, and now as the knight is no longer controlling the f3 square, we have knight to f3. 
Uh, so you do have to do something about this uh, threat here. Rook captures on d5 is played. C captures on d5, not allowing the pawn to stay a target. And now we have knight to e1, offering a trade here. Uh, and it's a sneaky move. So if you look at this position, Capablanca has a passed D pawn, uh, whereas Tarash has a passed B pawn. And uh, Tarash's pawn is uh, much further from Capablanca's king uh, than Capablanca's pawn is from Tarash's king. So white uh, white could even be better here. Uh, but um, Tarash is also, by playing this knight to E1 move, uh, is basically offering a draw. As he's offering Capablanca to capture on H2, and that's a well-calculated draw. For, for example, if Capablanca captures, knight captures on H2 with check, king g2, uh, then you can push the d4 pawn. Let's say d4, uh, a temporary knight sacrifice, king captures, d3 now, uh, knight to g2, d2, and now knight to e3. Uh, guarding the d1 square, you can push it, let's say you bring a queen, knight captures, rook captures, and now comes rook to a5, attacking the g5 pawn here, f6 defending, and now a4, attacking the pawn here. Rook d2 attacking both uh, the f pawn and the b pawn after the king defends. Now you will capture this pawn. White captures this pawn, and now uh, it's two rooks, two pawns uh, each. Uh, you know the pawn, uh, the pawn setup is a uh, well pretty symmetrical, so uh, it would be a dead draw. And uh, Tarash knows this. That's why he played knight to e1. But Capablanca declines it. He is not ready to just to call it a draw just yet. Uh, we have rook to e8 now again. Or threatening rook captures and rook to g1 checkmate. Uh, Tarash plays knight uh, captures on f3. We have g captures on f3. Now Capablanca uh, fixes his pawn structure. Also, the pawn is very nicely controlling the uh, e2 and the g2 squares here. Uh, we have rook to d6 by Tarash. Of course, you have to put a rook behind a passed pawn. That's how that's how chess works. Uh, and Capablanca plays rooks, uh, rook to c8. Uh, now, of course, if... Uh, Tarash would, uh, would capture on d5, then Capablanca could deliver rook to c1 check uh, after the rook blocks, then uh, this would be checkmate, as we already mentioned, the pawn is controlling e2 and g2. Uh, but Tarash, uh, of course, will not fall for, 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 for something like this. King to e1 was played, and here uh, rook to e8 check by Capablanca. King to back to f1, uh, and here rook back to c8 by Capablanca, and it was in this position that these two great players uh, agreed to a draw. Uh, as if you decided to continue, it wouldn't really um, change anything. For example, if you continued this line, uh, king e1, rook e8 check, and now you actually uh, played king to d1, then even after something like rook to e2, uh, you don't want to allow black such activity, but it would still be a draw after rook captures, rook captures, rook captures here with check, uh, king to f8, and now after you start pushing your pass pawn, rook captures on h2, uh, threatening to, to queen the f pawn soon, but then king defends, and now Capablanca has, uh, well, his uh, pass pawn is further down the board, but still, uh, I mean, it's a double death pawn, and uh, it's a completely drawn endgame. Uh, so after rook to c8, they decided uh, that this was a draw, and it indeed was a draw. Uh, so after four games in the two, in the 1911 San Sebastian tournament, Capablanca is now uh, two draws and two two wins, so still without a loss, and he's doing uh, pretty great against uh, such such very strong players. Uh, so yeah, uh, that's uh, the game. I do hope you enjoyed it. Uh, we're gonna be covering uh, game five of this tournament uh, fairly soon. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Tristan Cummings, uh, Vitor De Grezzi, uh, Ramgopal Galkota, uh, Adam Misoski, and uh, Alex Rudik for a contribution to my channel. Thank you a lot, I really appreciate it. And uh, for those of you who weren't following my other social networks, uh, I will put a link in the description below. It will be the first thing you see. Um, uh, a certain gentleman created, a, a, let's say, a, a best moments video of my channel. Uh, so if you enjoy it, uh, this channel, I mean, uh, do click on the first link in the description below, and uh, you know it's a, it's really a, um, a very a very nice video, you know, excellent editing and uh, really a nice compilation of uh, great moments throughout uh, the years. Uh, so yeah, uh, as usual, you can check two of my previous videos here. Thank you all for watching, and uh, I will see you soon, uh, hopefully with some more interesting content. Thank you all, and I'll see you soon.